So to start off, I just want again, thank you for your time. I have Javier Gonzalez from the University of Bath joining me today. And I'm very excited for this interview because we have a lot of overlap in our interests when it comes to nutrition, exercise science, metabolism, your metabolism whiz. I've been following you on Twitter for a bit now. And every time I feel like I understand something, I see one of your tweets and I'm like, yep, nope. I, there, I've got a lot to learn. Um, so if you wouldn't mind briefly just giving some of your background um, and your research interests before jumping into some specific questions, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. And uh, thanks for the invite. I'm really, really looking forward to the chat today. So I'm um, an associate professor at the University of Bath, which is in the southwest of um, England. Um you can probably see by my name that I've got a uh, Spanish heritage as well. So I'm half Spanish, half English. Um, and yeah, my research interests are in carbohydrate and fat metabolism, whether that relates to performance, which um, normally lends itself to the endurance type exercise, um, or whether it relates to, to health. Um, so mainly understanding risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease and how we can use nutrition and physical activity to try and either lower that risk of disease or improve human performance. How did you get into this area of research? Are you an athlete yourself or what? Um, so always been interested in sport. Um, I grew up playing rugby union um, and through uh, injuries gave that up and uh, as as most researchers seem to be um, researching they try they're trying to understand why they never made it as an athlete um, so that's probably true for me as well uh, so I, I did a sport and exercise science degree first of all um, then continue through master's PhD and was was always interested in nutrition and I do have quite a prominent memory of one of the lab classes in my undergraduate where um I was the participant and took some sodium bicarbonate and uh, was just amazed at that feeling of how it could something nutritionally could directly improve performance so powerfully and and wanting to understand how that works really um, sparked something in me and um, yeah led me down the path of, of research. Awesome um, okay so because a lot of what I would like to talk about today has to do with metabolic health and glycemic control um, maybe just give a brief overview of how blood sugar is regulated yeah in, in a um, normal like healthy individual and then what the difference is between that and someone who's insulin resistant or type 2 diabetic sure sure so in in the average healthy person when you first wake up in the morning um your blood glucose concentration will probably be between or should be between 3.5 millimoles per liter and six millimoles per liter i mean normally it's within four or five um, and whilst that's a concentration, it doesn't really tell us about the flux that's underlying that. So if you want that in, in other units, it's probably about um, four or five grams of glucose in, in the average healthy person. And yet that's turning over constantly. And what I mean by that is there's a continuous appearance of glucose into the bloodstream and there's a continual disappearance out of the bloodstream. And when we wake up in that state in the morning, we're not doing any exercise, we're just resting in bed, then the brain is normally the major user of glucose in that scenario. So um, using probably over five grams an hour um, and the total amount of glucose that's appearing and disappearing from the circulation at that time is in an 80 kilo person, it's probably about 10 grams per, per hour. So there's 10 grams per hour turnover and yet there's only five grams actually circulating in, in the blood so if we didn't have glucose appearing into the circulation then we'd run out of it fairly quickly um, and yeah we'd be in a, a pretty bad way so it's where it's coming from in that state if we're not eating any food then it's mainly coming from the liver um, and it's coming from two sources within the liver um, so approximately half of it will be coming from the breakdown of glycogen which is the storage form of carbohydrate and about 50% will be coming from gluconeogenesis, which is the, the production of glucose from non-glucose sources. So that could be amino acids or um, glycerol from coming from the fat tissue. Um, so yeah, in the fasted resting state, um, all of the glucose is essentially coming from, from the liver. What proportion are coming from gluconeogenesis or gluconeogenic substrates versus glycogenolysis? Yeah. So approximately 50-50 in that early morning fasted state. If you were to not eat anything then for a number of days, 
um, the proportion shifts quite drastically. So there are studies where people have fasted for, say, three days. And what you tend to see there is once you've run out of glycogen, it's no longer providing um, glucose to the circulation. And so almost 100% of the glucose coming from the liver is from gluconeogenesis. But the absolute rate of gluconeogenesis doesn't change very much at all. So mm-hmm. um, at least in humans, um, either in the postprandial state or if you provide precursors or anything, the absolute rate remains relatively constant. The, co- the sources for gluconeogenesis could change quite a lot, but the absolute rate remains constant. But it does become a larger proportion of the total amount of glucose appearing from the liver because the total amount comes down as the glycogen glycogenolysis comes down. And is that just because we have less glucose requirements at that point? Um, So it's probably um, both lower glucose requirements as we're shifting to using more fat as a fuel and we've got ketone bodies available as well. Yeah. Um, And also that we're running out of the glycogen itself. So there's just less in the liver to be able to be liberated um, as as glucose. Right. But blood sugar is still staying within like the four. 3.5 3.5 to yeah. 5 range probably exactly so in healthy people we can fast for quite a long time and keep our blood glucose concentration stable as we're shifting to the the use of other fuels like the ketone bodies cool so in a someone with insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes they're what's happening at the level of the liver so they're not responding to insulin and now they're not shutting down like they're not yeah they're not shutting down hepatic glucose output is that what a major defect is It is, and it could be one of a few things. So um, a high glucose concentration could be either that the liver is putting out too much glucose relative to the requirements, or that the peripheral tissues aren't taking up enough glucose for that given scenario. And um, this is where it probably depends a little bit on if we're talking about the fasting state and the postprandial state. And that's because, um, at least in healthy people, the liver will shut off glucose production or the rate of appearance of glucose at relatively low insulin concentrations. So very small changes from fasting to just a small amount of of insulin in the postprandial state will have a big effect on shutting off liver glucose production, whereas the effects on uh, muscle glucose uptake and peripheral glucose uptake, they happen at the higher concentrations uh, of insulin. So when we're talking about the fasting state, if we see a high fasting glucose, more often than not, it probably reflects something going on with the liver. Whereas if there are issues in the postprandial state, then it probably more likely reflects issues with muscle glucose uptake. Are there um, phenotypic, sorry to interrupt, are there like different types of type 2 diabetes where someone's like more liver defect, more muscle? Yeah, there, there almost certainly is. Um, and in in kind of the general practice, it's never really looked at. Um, there's possibly implications for the way that might be managed as well. Um, so there could be certain dietary approaches or exercise approaches that are more potent at affecting the liver versus the muscle, as an example. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. And how much insulin are we talking? Like you said, a very small amount can shut down hepatic glucose output, like in terms of like carbohydrate i know everyone secretes probably different amount of insulin for a given amount of carbohydrate but like if you were to eat just one piece of bread or like an apple is that enough to shut down hepatic glucose output yeah i mean great question so um probably just to take it back a step um some people might show equivalent shutting off of liver glucose production after a meal but at the expense of very different insulin concentrations. So before we see changes in in actual glucose metabolism, we can get compensatory changes in insulin secretion. And so you might have, if you take two individuals, one might be very insulin sensitive and the other one might be less insulin sensitive and they have the same glucose concentrations. If we measure even glucose turnover might be similar, but the less insulin sensitive person will be secreting more insulin to achieve the same effect. And so you really need to measure both insulin and glucose concentrations and ideally the the flux to really understand that. Um, Difficult therefore to say with a piece of bread um, because it really does depend on that interplay between um, insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity and even there's a third layer to that, which is um, something called the incretin effect. So we commonly hear when we talk about glucose metabolism, that the pancreas is where we secrete insulin from. 
and that it responds to the blood glucose concentration, which is true. So as our blood glucose increases, our pancreas can detect that and secrete insulin. But we also know that if you infuse glucose into a vein versus eating the same um, amount of glucose so that you achieve a similar blood glucose concentration, you get a much bigger insulin response if you've eaten that glucose versus the intravenous infusion. So that suggests that the gut is detecting that glucose and causing extra insulin secretion. And we now know that that's because of the increase in hormones, GIP and GLP-1. They're released by the intestine and they potentiate insulin secretion by the pancreas. So it becomes quite complex quite quickly. Yeah, super interesting. Um, so wait, this just came to the top of my head. If you, if a type 2 diabetic isn't responding properly to insulin and isn't shutting down hepatic glucose output, would they wake up with lower liver glycogen content? Um, it's quite possible. Um, it then depends on whether they have increased gluconeogenesis or whether it's uh, increased glycogen analysis. But yeah, in essence, you'd, right. you could see um, higher glycogen analysis overnight and therefore running low on glycogen. When, when it's been directly measured, so there are... Um, there have been a few studies where they've directly measured in that morning before eating the um, liver glycogen concentration in people with and without diabetes. They don't really see large differences. And that might be because liver glycogen is, is also subject to auto regulation, which just means that um, the more liver glycogen that's there, the more readily it will break down. And the less glycogen that, that's there, the more there is a stimulus to synthesize glycogen. And so in that morning, we, it might have just equilibrated out overnight for, for some of that auto-regulation. Okay. So speaking of overnight liver concentrations, fasted exercise is a big portion of your research. So love to go into that. Um, so what happens to our blood? So if we wake up after an overnight fast, our muscle glycogen is pretty much untouched, not changed, but our liver glycogen content will be different from when we went to bed. Yeah. Um, so what happens to our blood sugar when we wake up and do a bout of exercise in a normal, healthy person? Yeah. So as soon as we start exercising, the requirement for glucose by the muscle will increase very quickly in proportion to the intensity as well. So the more intense the exercise, the more the glucose uptake into muscle. Um, and so we're going to have to respond to deal with that. Otherwise our blood glucose is going to decrease very mm. drastically. And so the liver starts putting out more glu glucose and that's mainly coming from the breakdown of glycogen. Um, and yeah, it responds rapidly and in proportion to the exercise. So when we measure blood glucose concentrations during exercise, at least with moderate intensity exercise, it doesn't change drastically, but the rate of turnover can increase more than twofold very very easily so we've got increased flux through the system um, but it's matching perfectly between liver glucose production and muscle glucose uptake All right so if you're doing higher intensity though we do see that spike in blood sugar um and i'm That's only aware true. of really like the type 1 diabetic research so you get the spike in blood sugar that's mismatched the amount it's just like happening quicker than our muscles are taking in glucose yeah, exactly that. And it does happen in people with and without diabetes. Um, and if anything, you get a bigger response in a well-trained individual, um, probably because they've got a greater absolute exercise intensity. So the stimulus is all higher. Right. Um, but it's exactly that. You've got a stimulus for liver glucose output that exceeds the use by the muscle in that scenario, especially if you do a hard sprint and then you stop exercise where now the need for glucose uptake into muscle is has gone from high for a brief period to low again. The stimulus for liver glucose production happens, but then shutting that off takes a little bit more time. And so you can get a big spike in, in glucose concentrations. Yeah. And how would that differ if you were in the fasted versus postprandial state? Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's been directly assessed at least with the, glu the with the tracers to understand those sources of rates of appearance and disappearance but um, at least theoretically if you're in the postprandial state you'll have more liver glycogen to begin with and so you could expect 
a greater increase in glucose concentration. Um, on the other hand, if you do exercise at least moderate intensity, when you're in the postprandial state, you can lower the postprandial response. But yeah, with high intensity exercise, it's more likely that you'd, you'd get a further increase because you've got more liver glycogen to break down and, and liberate into the circulation. Mm, okay. And then what happens when we eat after fasted versus fed exercise? Yeah, so this is um, an area I, I was got interested in during my PhD and then followed up with some tracer work afterwards because um, we, well, f first of all, if you think about, we commonly hear of, of the in insulin sensitizing effects of exercise. So if you do a bout of exercise, then in the period after exercise, your muscle is more responsive to insulin. Um, even before that, it's actually got a residual increased glucose uptake. On top of that, if you expose it to insulin, it's more sensitive to insulin after exercise versus after a period of rest. Um, and yet, if you eat a meal after exercise, you often don't see a change in the glucose concentration. Um, and we were intrigued by that. And part of it might be because a lot of the studies that look at the, effect, the insulin sensitizing effect of exercise sometimes use single limb exercise. And there is some evidence that just exercising one limb can have effects on other limbs in the body. So what you're doing is you're increasing fatty acid availability during exercise. The muscle that's exercising is using those and burning them as fuel. The other muscles are exposed to those fatty acids, but aren't necessarily using them as fuel because they're not exercising. Right. And so you could get lipid buildup in non-exercise muscle that at the whole body level then might balance things out. Um, but then to add on fasted versus fed exercise, um, at least with a single bout of exercise, we found that when you have your post-exercise meal, if you'd had breakfast before the exercise, then you actually get an increase in the rate of appearance of glucose after exercise. And that's coming, at least a substantial proportion of that is coming from the gut. So we think there are changes within the stomach, the intestine, um, due to doing your exercise in a fed state that might result in an increase in the rate of appearance of glucose after exercise when you have your second meal of the day. Now, I should also emphasize that we've only really seen that in people without diabetes. And there have been some other studies that have looked at across the insulin sensitivity spectrum from very insulin sensitive through to frank type 2 diabetes. And it seems like this effect happens in people who are insulin sensitive, but the more insulin resistant we get, kind of the less of an effect you see here. So it's probably not a pathological thing that you see this increase in rate of appearance of glucose. It's probably a physiological response. And, and some people have argued, uh, not that I really think a teleological perspective is, is always appropriate, but people have argued that it um, makes sense in terms of restoring muscle glycogen after exercise to have a rapid rate of appearance of, of exogenous glucose into the circulation. Right. Cause if you're feeding, so is there like an additive effect? Like you are given carbohydrates pre-exercise, you have this insulin, now you have this insulin independent GLUT4 translocation. And so now you have like double the amount, like, does it, is that what's causing like a greater rate of glycogen repletion? Um, so it's, it could be contributing. And we certainly did see increased rate of disappearance of glucose um, and an increased metabolic clearance rate. But I think the interesting part or the intriguing part, because we're not sure of the mechanism is that in your meal after exercise, um, you've got an increased rate of digestion and absorption of that meal okay. if you'd had breakfast before exercise. Okay. Okay. So having the breakfast before exercise is doing something to your gut, which means that when you have your second meal after exercise, that meal is more rapidly entering the circulation. Interesting. You think that it would be the opposite, like gastric yep. absorption would be if you had empty because like isn't gastric absorption increased like for your first meal of the day yeah yeah so there, there could even be counter regulatory effects on gastric emptying but certainly when so, and we didn't measure gastric emptying all we measured was rate of appearance of right. the glucose from the meal that's ingested that was enhanced which it could be something to do with blood flow so we know for example when you exercise um you redirect blood away from the gut and to the muscle but if you exercise 
after a meal, when you've got food in the stomach, then you retain more blood flow to the gut. Mm -hmm. So it might be a blood flow effect that is then residual after exercise. That was one of the things we've speculated, but yeah, not sure. Interesting. Okay. So just to wrap this up on postprandial glucose, you, if you eat breakfast and then you exercise or you fast and then you exercise and then have this postprandial or this meal after exercise, you're going to, are the, like, is you're saying, talking about the rate of appearance and rate of disappearance, but is the postprandial glucose excursion the same? Pretty much the same. No big differences in concentration, but differences in flux. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And, and I should emphasize that's only with a single bout of exercise, right? So things might right. be different with training, which we could maybe get onto. But I've seen some of your research about like the second meal effect. Yeah. So how does that work into this? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, um, that's how I got into this exact question actually, because at least at rest, if you take exercise out of the equation, um, your blood glucose response to the second meal of the day tends to be better in a sense of a lower glucose excursion compared to your first meal of the day. And there's numerous reasons for that. Um, one is probably related to insulin priming. So, um, if you expose your liver and your muscle to insulin, um, then it's primed for the second exposure to insulin. Right. And you can then play around with that because you might, you might first of all think, well, if you give, what's the benefit of getting the second meal effect at lunch, if you're exposing yourself to a high carbohydrate breakfast with a big glucose excursion, then you're just getting a small benefit for a potentially a negative thing, first of all. But right. um, because it's not all about the glucose, because it seems to be insulin that seems to be a major driver, um, you can use protein at breakfast where you still get an insulin response. And that seems to still elicit the second meal effect later on in the day. Hmm. So what is the second meal effect caused by then? Because like, is it if you're saying like priming, does that mean that like you're priming as in your you have just more glute transporters on the membrane available? So that the next meal. So that's is that what you mean by priming? So the, the liver and the muscle actually become more insulin sensitive. So oh. uh, when they are then exposed to that second amount bolus of insulin um, for the same amount of insulin, they'll be taking up more glucose from the circulation. The, the other thing we sometimes see as well is that actually the insulin response um, is better too, in the sense of um, that the more rapid you switch on insulin secretion. So the early phase insulin secretion, which is essentially in the first 15 minutes, okay. like for like the, the, the earlier insulin secretion is more potent than the insulin that's secreted later on. And when you look at those insulin curves, you get more rapid increases in insulin secretion with that second meal versus the first meal. Okay. Um, so it's both um, a change in insulin secretion and an increase in insulin sensitivity with both the liver and the muscle. So there's a there's a lot of things going on there that all contribute to this second meal effect. Ugh, metabolism is so confusing. Yeah. Um, okay, I do I do want to take a step back though and just discuss like why we even care about postprandial glucose excursions because I think that this is also very convoluted and maybe misinterpreted or misunderstood because truthfully I'm trying to figure it out myself and I like to me it makes sense to lower postprandial glucose excursions like is that but what I'm trying to wrap my head around is like is there something inherent about a postprandial glucose spike that is potentially impacting cardiovascular disease risk like independent of body weight or caloric intake like what are your what's your view on postprandial glucose yeah uh great question it's a bit of a, a meaty one as well so um i think if it's useful to compare it against some other cardiovascular disease risk markers like um ldl cholesterol or the apoB containing lipoproteins where it seems like across multiple lines of evidence that the relationship between um, the atherogenic lipoproteins and cardiovascular disease is fairly linear, i.e. the lower the better, for at least for cardiovascular disease risk. Um, with glucose, it's possible that it's still linear, but I'm not sure the evidence is there, or at least I haven't seen that evidence that it's linear across the whole range. So what, what we do know 
of course, is when glucose goes very high, then that is causing damage to the blood vessels, so mm-hmm. the small blood vessels and the large blood vessels. Certainly, once you're over about 10 millimoles per liter, um, it's causing oxidative stress and inflammation, and there are, there are issues. There's damage being caused there, mm-hmm. which over the long term, over a lifetime, can build up and increase our risk of cardiovascular disease. What's a separate question is within the range of, say, five to eight millimoles per liter, which is what we'd commonly see all of us every day if we're eating some carbohydrate, we'd see glucose excursions within that range, whether that is doing anything at all to our blood vessels. Now, I don't know the answer for sure. Um, There are some studies that do show associations between glucose responses and things like mortality even if you just discount people with diabetes. So then you're already excluding that very high 10 millimole per liter range. You're within what's the healthy range. So there there are associations there. I think it probably does depend on um, what you're trading off. So for example, if the way in which you're managing to lower your glucose concentration is at the sacrifice of some other health marker, be it high triglycerides or something else, then that's a consideration. If the way in which you're lowering glucose after a meal also lowers other things or doesn't change other things, and that's where exercise can be really helpful, um, then of course it's a bit of a safer bet. I don't yeah. know, have, have, you, have you got thoughts on that? I mean, if one of a big contributing factor to HbA1c is postprandial glucose and lower HbA1c seems better for long-term health, then lowering postprandial glucose would make sense to have a better average blood sugar level. Because I don't know if there, I mean, I'm sure there's scenarios where you can have frequent high blood sugar spikes, but in order to have a normal HbA1c, they must be met with like hypoglycemia. If we're trying to keep that average the same with a blood sugar spike versus just like more, less variability throughout the day, then to me, uh, lowering postprandial glucose seems like the healthier option. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And and I think um, it is also useful to, well, what's great is the increase in technologies we have nowadays with things like continuous glucose monitors. So yeah, the, you're right. The associations with HbA1c are useful. I think we also need to um, understand the relationships with the other technology as well, because whilst you're absolutely right, it could be that, the HbA1c is reflecting that postprandial glucose excursion. Um, it could also be reflecting changes in, say, the hemoglobin turnover, right? Mm-hmm. So you could get a lower HbA1c because you've got lower glucose concentrations or because you've got faster uh, hemoglobin turnover. So there could be a third factor there that influences things um, that could be related to longevity and increase hemoglobin turnover, but we're interpreting it as a lower glucose concentration. If we also show that same thing with continuous glucose monitors, then it we're triangulating with different methods and it gives us a bit more confidence that, that that's truly going on. Do you have any concerns with like the increased trends for wearing CGMs in non-diabetics? I mean, I think it can be overinterpreted sometimes and can, can potentially lead to... Um, some decisions that people perceive as being healthier when they're perhaps not uh, based on that trade-off argument I I gave earlier where yeah yeah, you could keep your glucose perfectly flat if you just don't eat any carbohydrate um, which could be a healthy approach but it depends on what else you're doing in your diet which could or could not be healthy so if, if you're eating a load of saturated fat then there's probably an argument that at a certain point that's going to cause issues independent from keeping your glucose low Right. So it's all, it's all nuanced and context specific for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I actually have seen something that you were mentioning on Twitter about like the difference between interstitial glucose levels and like why a CGM like could be problematic for interpreting glucose levels. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, the continuous glucose monitors that are currently available are measuring the glucose concentration within interstitial fluid, which is the fluid that essentially bathes all our cells. And that's not um, our blood glucose. And it depends on the question we're interested in as to which one is most relevant. Um, 
most of the time we're interested in the arterial concentration of glucose because that's what the brain sees it's what the peripheral tissues all see it's what's relevant for the rate of appearance of, of glucose as well um now measuring arterial concentrations isn't easy to directly measure in an artery you need an arterial line and, and that has risks and is normally only done in a clinical setting there are little tricks that you can do to get good representations of arterial bloods um sometimes known as arterialized blood where you can heat the back of the hand and sample blood from a, a vein in the back of the hand or even capillary blood. So if you just take a finger prick blood sample, then that will be pretty closely representative of arterial blood. Mm -hmm. But it differs, it tends to differ from interstitial fluids. Um, sometimes it's just a lag and a time delay, but sometimes there's more than that as well going on. And especially in um, scenarios like exercise, where you get big changes in blood flow and distribution of blood to different tissues and that kind of thing, at least we quite often see quite large differences there and also differences in um, then the interpretation of a postprandial glucose curve where if you measure glucose concentrations in a vein or in interstitial fluid you can quite often see a dip below baseline um, when you have a meal whereas if you measure in the arterial blood or the arterialized blood sometimes you don't see that dip at all. So in the same individual, you would see a dip because, and that's largely because the insulin from the meal is causing glucose uptake by the muscle and those tissues. So when you measure a vein that's draining the tissue, the concentration is low because the tissue is taking it up. Whereas in the artery, it's still relatively high. The brain has that glucose available as fuel. And so the interpretation can be quite different if you're measuring it in an interstitial fluid versus arterial. Blood. interesting okay this is all great stuff to know as i'm using cgms in my research so <laughs> um but okay i know i'm flipping all over the place but i do want to go back to fasted exercise and talk about some of like the reasons why so well we didn't even talk about this but there's that seminal paper where they took um healthy individual or healthy recreationally active men put them on this hypercaloric diet had them fasted exercise in the fasted state versus breakfast fed when the carbohydrate fed state and only the fasted group saw these improvements in insulin sensitivity, which this was a profound paper for me to read. I love it. I would love to see what would happen in women as well. Um, but what would be mechanisms to explain why fasted exercise, we might see these improvements in metabolic health in, I guess in the context of endurance training, but, um, yeah, like the, we know it's pretty well reported that we increase fat oxidation rates during fasted exercise. Um, and I think that that's one of the candidate mechanisms that you've talked about in your review papers as well as to why we might be seeing these improvements in insulin sensitivity, but yeah, anyways, I'll let you go into that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I agree that it's a great paper. It, um, it really sparked my my interest in that area. And yeah, we've done a bit of work ourselves on it. And um, uh, so one angle is that people could see a change in body mass if they do exercise in a fasted state, if they end up compensating with food intake or, or other physical activity. Now, in our studies, um, we let energy balance vary, but it just so happened that in the two groups, they lost a similar amount of weight and so in a way that's nice because we can take that out of the picture as a potential mechanism and we we speculate that it could be due to the increased fat turnover um possibly that so we know for example that um if you just measure in a sedentary population the amount of fat within the muscle the intramuscular triglyceride then it positively correlates with insulin resistance so the more fat in the muscle the less insulin sensitive people are but endurance athletes, um, it's often been called the athlete's paradox. They seem to show high intramuscular lipid, but also high insulin sensitivity. And so then this idea of lipid turnover becomes important, where if we've got these stagnant pools of lipid within muscle, they might produce intermediates or other things that um, induce insulin resistance. And there are candidates there like the diacylglycerols and ceramides and that kind of thing. 
Whereas if we've got high turnover of those pools of lipid within the muscle, they're more safely stored. We're not getting these intermediate metabolites that could interfere with um, the insulin signaling cascade or an aspect of insulin sensitivity. So that's one potential mechanism. Another is that um, when we do the exercise and we've got high fatty acid availability, that can stimulate some of the important signaling cascades like AMPK, uh, adenosine monophosphate activated protein kinase. In turn, that can produce some adaptations within the muscle, including increased GLUT4 content, which is the main transporter that allows glucose to enter the muscle. And we saw that in the study we did, there was more AMPK and more GLUT4 in the muscle after the training in the fasted state. And then a third potential mechanism is um, a change in the saturated to unsaturated fatty acid composition of the cell membrane. And so, again, going back to um, some previous work, it's been shown that if you just exercise one leg, so let's say you just exercise your right leg um, over a period of weeks, even though both legs are getting the same diet because you're eating the same um, for both of those legs, the leg that exercises ends up having fewer saturated fats in the phospholipid membrane of the muscle. Um, and it's probably because when you increase physical activity, you preferentially increase the oxidation of saturated fat versus uh, unsaturated fat. And if you ramp that up with exercise in a fasted state where you're burning even more fat than in a fed state, maybe there's even greater turnover of that saturated fat store and a, a remodeling of those phospholipids and the way we think that might relate to insulin sensitivity is that when you've got fewer saturated fats in the phospholipid membrane, um, the cell is thought to be more fluid, that membrane. And so GLUT4 can more easily translocate and allow glucose to enter the cell. Now, that's largely hypothetical, but um, e each piece of that puzzle has been shown to some extent, um, but just not in a comprehensive picture. Super interesting. I'm... A little stuck on the free fatty acid availability and AMPK stuff, because I guess like the understanding is mostly just glycogen depletion, AMP, AMP and ADP accumulate, this activates AMPK, but now we're dissociating it and relating it to free fatty acid availability. What do we know about that? Yeah. So they do see, there's probably three, um, at least three ways in which AMPK can be activated during exercise. And one is that change in the ATP AMP ratio. So you're changing the energy status of the cell, but then on the substrate basis, as, as you rightly say, the, um, the glycogen concentration in the muscle will affect AMPK activity. It's got a glycogen binding domain on it. Um, but there is also evidence that, independent of both of those, if you just increase fatty acid availability um, by infusing lipid with heparin to, to hydrolyze the lipid, that can directly increase AMPK activity in, in muscle as well. So um, yeah, again, it's a complex picture, but um, there, there have been studies that have tried to independently isolate each of those things, and they all seem to be playing a role. Um, the glycogen is could be playing a role in some scenarios. In, in our study, we didn't see large changes in glycogen concentration. Um, so we're not sure that played a role there, but it, it could have been, we just might have missed it. Yeah, no, that'd be cool. If, like if you're burning the same amount of glycogen, then you are kind of looking at the effects independent of, of glycogen depletion. Yeah. Um, and then how would you think that this would like change with high intensity exercise? If that's a glycolytic activity, then we'd be burning more glycogen free i don't know what happens to fatty acid availability in response to high intensity exercise yeah i mean my my view on this and i may be wrong but uh, as it currently stands i think the effect of fasting and feeding prior to exercise would only really be seen at moderate intensity exercise um, and that's because with the high intensity exercise it's glycolytic the um you'll get a stimulus for fatty acid release by adrenaline um so after exercise, at least you might you might get a spike in uh, non-acerified fatty acids and, and glycerol. But I would strongly suspect that that would be similar whether you were fasted or fed, because the the stimulus of exercise is then so strong that the effect of the meal is is blunted quite a lot. 
How do you think, or maybe this has even been done like post-exercise delaying a meal? Cause it, um, what you're saying right now, it's almost like, okay, endurance exercise, maybe you do fasted, maybe high intensity, you fast afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, we've done a little bit on it as have others in terms of after moderate exercise, delaying carbohydrate refeeding and looking at glucose tolerance the next day. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't seen it done after high intensity exercise, but certainly with a moderate intensity exercise, if you retain the carbohydrate and energy deficit of exercise, then you have a greater improvement in insulin sensitivity the next day based on glucose tolerance tests. Um, so maybe there's a possibility there of whichever suits you best. If you want to uh, restrict the carbohydrate before exercise or after exercise, the problem, each one is going to have an effect. You're going to need to eat at some point. So you, you probably do want to eat before or after. And maybe, as you say, it, it might depend on the intensity of exercise. Um, and like my understanding of measuring substrate utilization is that once you pass your lactate threshold, then it doesn't, you 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 lose your confidence in whatever marker you're getting. Um, so how do they even know that high intensity exercise isn't burning more fat in the fasted state? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, it's a good point. So yeah, once we're above lactate threshold, then you've got, so the, the principle of measuring substrate use, at least with indirect calorimetry is that the oxygen consumption and the carbon dioxide production are coming from metabolism. Mm -hmm. Whereas when we go to high intensity exercise, some of that carbon dioxide production is going to be coming from buffering the acidosis of, of exercise. Right. And so we can't be confident that it's all from metabolism. Um, some of the evidence that does support that um, fat oxidation is somewhat low at high intensity exercise is from either um, muscle biopsy and tracer studies where they've measured rates of appearance and disappearance of blood-borne fatty acids and the intramuscular fat use. And they the data from those seem consistent with um, the indirect calorimetry, even though that has its limitations at high-intensity exercise. I am aware of um, some work being done in New Zealand by David Rowlands, where he's got a method, developing a method to try and assess fat oxidation at high intensity exercise using a, a pretty clever technique with um, the intramuscular labeling of, of substrates with tracers, and then um, using that to overcome that limitation. Um, so yeah, that may be available in the next few years or so. But um, yeah, as I say, so most of the evidence does seem to support that idea that a high intensity exercise carbohydrate is the predominant fuel there, there probably is some fat oxidation going on. Um, and we're just not sure on how much really. Yeah. Cause like, I, I remember reading one of Dan Plews's paper showing that trained individuals, I mean, it makes sense. Trained individuals will burn a higher proportion of fat at any absolute intensity. Um, but they they compared untrained versus trained and showed that even at these high intensities, these trained individuals are burning more fat. So there must be something that's training our muscles in, to be able to burn more fat. And I wonder if like fasted high intensity exercise, like we know that there's aerobic adaptations to high intensity exercise, but if your substrate utilization during that bout of exercise isn't different between the fed and fasted state yeah i don't know i'm trying to wrap my head around all of this <laughs> yeah 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 and I, I guess oh there's the one piece of evidence that um supports a potential limitation for the muscle to burn fat at high intensity exercise is that you seem to get accumulation of um the fatty acids within the muscle as in with the exercise, you can increase fatty acid availability, even with even with infusing fatty acids into the bloodstream. So you, you're giving the fat available to the muscle to use during very high intensity exercise. It seems to still be able to take it up as well. So it crosses the membrane into the muscle, but the limiting step might be actually getting into the mitochondria in the muscle. So one of the suggestions is to do with carnitine availability and how with high, um, high, flux through the glycolysis pathway with high intensity exercise we end up using our carnitine for buffering some of that aspect that leaves less carnitine available to transport fats into the mitochondria because the long chain fatty acids need to be transported with carnitine into mitochondria to be burned 
maybe there are differences there with training status. Um, maybe the endurance trained athletes with more mitochondria, more carnitine might have a greater capacity there at high intensity exercise even. Um, but at least in the average trained individual, it does seem like there is some of somewhat of a limitation to the fatty acids getting into the mitochondria to be burned with high intensity exercise. Hmm. So if you're someone who likes to wake up and do your high intensity workout on an empty stomach, maybe you should take some carnitine. Uh, possibly supplementing with carnitine. Yeah. Yeah. Although it does take quite a long time to build up in muscle. So, oh. um, probably takes three to six months of supplementation to actually build up in muscle. So it needs a bit of commitment. Wow. Yeah. wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's go transition into energy balance. Cause I know this is a big area of your research as well. So um, how does exercise in the fasted versus fed state affect how much we eat later in the day and our appetite regulation? And what does this have yeah. to do with liver glycogen levels? Yeah, so I'd probably start by just saying that these measures are hugely variable, right? So the metabolic measures are variable, but um, the the energy balance measures are even more so um, because not only are they subject to some of the physiological regulation, but of course our behaviors are also influenced by a whole load of things outside of our physiology. And I'm a physiologist, so I'll leave that to someone else. Um, now, we do... I'm intrigued by this prospect of um, whether the fuels we use during exercise influence our energy balance behaviors. Um, it's been a controversial question and it's been studied on and off for years. Um, one of the first to really propose it is JP flat, uh, the glucogenic static theory and the glycogenostatic static theory. Mm. And the, the, one of the central premises is that um, if you compare our fat and our carbohydrate stores, we've got a huge amount of fat available. Even in lean people, there's loads of fat to fuel activity for days and days on end, If we even if we don't eat anything. Whereas our carbohydrate stores are really limited. We can't even run for a few hours without running out of them. And so it would make sense that our body would regulate our carbohydrate stores more tightly than our fat stores because we'll run out of them otherwise and uh, carbohydrates an important fuel for the brain. Um, in practice, when that's been manipulated in humans, it's tricky to us to directly manipulate liver and muscle glycogen without changing a whole load of other things. Um, in rodents, it's a little bit easier. And there are studies in rodents that if you genetically manipulate the liver glycogen concentration, then it does seem to influence both energy intake and physical activity. So if they've got a higher liver glycogen concentration, they will tend to eat less and be more physically active. Um, in humans, there's indirect evidence that is somewhat supportive, but um, it's always indirect and, and correlational. So we've got some evidence that people who seem to be using their liver glycogen more during exercise tend to then eat more in that first meal after exercise. And there's also now some evidence that some of the um, the pharmaceutical agents that lower glucose concentrations, so things like SGLT2 inhibitors and um, maybe the GLP-1 receptor agonists, might also change energy balance behaviors, might lower physical activity levels, for example. So hmm. whether the signal is glucose concentration or liver glycogen concentration or rate of change in liver glycogen, we really don't know. Um, but there's increasing evidence that there's something going on there. And yeah, it's, it's an active area we're, we're trying to research as well. And you said like how much liver glycogen you burn through during exercise, what regulates how much liver glycogen we burn through during exercise? Yeah. Uh, a whole host of factors. <laughs> the main, the main thing would be how much glycogen is there to begin with and the intensity of exercise. Uh, so the more intense the exercise, the more rapid you'll be burning through your liver glycogen. Mm. There's probably some individual differences in how much glycogen we use, which might be related to things like our training status and our capacity for fat oxidation and um, a whole load of other inputs. But the, the major ones would be the intensity of exercise and the amount of glycogen you've got to begin with. So if you're fasted or fed. Um you brought up our capacity for fat oxidation. So has any of your research shown that fasted exercise improves our capacity for fat oxidation? 
Um, yeah, we, we did study that in this training study where it was a, a bit of a mammoth effort from the PhD student, Rob Edinburgh at the time, because he took Douglas bags for every 10 minutes of every single training session over six weeks. So we could measure fat oxidation during the training, but we also did tests at baseline, midpoint, and at follow-up to see if that capacity for fat oxidation had changed. And whereas during the training, when people were fasted or fed, we saw the difference in fat oxidation that was sustained over the full six weeks of, of exercise. When we then tested all of the groups in the same conditions, all in the fasted state, we saw no difference in the capacity for fat oxidation. So mm. at least in that population, we couldn't detect uh, a, an adaptation in that capacity for fat oxidation. Mm. Interesting. So, okay, I put out that question on Twitter asking about fasted versus fed fat max tests as a measure of metabolic flexibility. And I use that all that terminology based on the Sam Milan and Brooks paper where they show the metabolically impaired people have this very low fat max versus uh, ultra or endurance athlete, professional athletes. Um, and so where I guess, hmm, I don't even know my question, but you said, I don't think that that's a measure of, I wouldn't say that that's a measure of metabolic flexibility. And do you want to unpack that a little bit? Sure. I guess, I guess it comes to um, the classical definition of, of metabolic flexibility, which um, was really proposed by Kelly and Mandarino, where they um, study people in the fasted and then the insulin stimulated state. Um, and just measured then the fuel use across the muscle, across the leg. Um, so, and, and based on the definition of that paper, it is along the lines of a greater metabolic flexibility would be a greater difference between fasted and fed state. Right. Um, I mean, I don't think, I, I, I'd like to think, in, I, I'll have to check the tweet now, but um, <laughs> I, I don't think I'd be certain in my response. I say, I'm, I'm not sure it, it's a definition <laughs> of metabolic flexibility. Um, Sorry if I used the incorrect. <laughs> no problem. No, uh, um, so yeah, I guess what where you're coming from is um, with a, a maximal fat oxidation test, you're measuring that maximum capacity for fat oxidation. Um, I mean, if one there's still there's even an argument as to whether that test is most appropriate for that because the highest rate of fat oxidation is going to happen probably after a few hours of exercise, once you've depleted your glycogen stores. Um, and so if you if you wanted to measure someone's true inherent highest capacity for fat oxidation, it's probably not when we do our fat max test, which only lasts 20 minutes or so. Right. So there are, I mean, you can always, no, no method is perfect. And so um, as I kind of indicated there, I think it has a place and with the appropriate standardization and it can still answer questions that we're interested in. So all else being equal, does this person, is this person likely to burn more fat than this person? If your fat max test shows that, it probably is likely to be the case that in other scenarios, they're burning more fat, but there are some caveats to that. And do you think that that is, could be a marker of greater metabolic flexibility? Like if you have greater fat oxidation rates, I think not on its own, because you could get scenarios where people might be adapted to a high fat diet. And the normal adaptation to that is a high rate of fat oxidation, but a low rate of carbohydrate oxidation when stimulated. Mm -hmm. And so I guess for, for a measure of metabolic flexibility, you need at least two points to balance off each other, because you need right. to show a high capacity for fat oxidation and a high capacity for carbohydrate oxidation yeah. which is why that fasted to fed transition is is one that i quite like yeah i guess there has to be two two ends of the spectrum like metflex lipid metflex carbohydrate um interesting okay i'm i'm interested in the question of whether fasted exercise can improve metabolic flexibility um just based on like this energetic stress, we're stressing, we're exercising now in this liver depleted state. Does that improve our capacity to burn fat? And then pairing that with a mixed diet, say you're not on a low carbohydrate diet, does that now preserve our ability to burn carbohydrates while also maximizing this fat oxidation? And like, now can we transition between the two better? I don't know. That's 
I guess. Yeah, I mean, that that would be super interesting because uh, I guess to cap, so we, people commonly talk on the um, metabolic inflexibility of the low carbohydrate, high fat diet, but there is also the argument on the opposite of we adapt to either diet. So if we've been eating high carbohydrate diets, our glucose tolerance tends to improve, but our oral fat tolerance tends to get worse. And so mm -hmm. we can adapt to high carb and we can adapt to low carb. But what we really want to do is retain that metabolic flexibility for either option. And I think you're right. One of the candidates for that is at least exercise in itself, but maybe mm -hmm. specifically in a fasted state to elicit some of those adaptations. Um, so yeah, sounds very interesting. Yeah. And then on the other end of that could be just, well, you eat a high carb diet and then you exercise to optimize the fat oxidation yeah, yeah. and then you're metabolically <laughs> flexible. How do you yeah. think of like just exercise in general? Like, do you think we're giving too much emphasis on like manipulating all these things around exercise or is it really just people would be way better? Well, I think that, I think that I'm always like getting into the minutiae and overcomplicating everything. But then that study where they had the overeating, I'm like everyone, if majority of people are gaining weight very slowly over year after year, then they are eating in a caloric surplus. So maybe fast exercise is this like preventative protective thing that's preserving metabolic health. If we're assuming everyone is just on this increased gaining weight trajectory, um, so yeah, like what, what do you think of, like, do you think sometimes we're going down rabbit holes? I mean, I'm sure my, my bias is, um, to understand those nuances because it's what I study, but, right. um, I, I can see an argument that just getting people more physically active in whatever way we can would provide some benefit, but on the counter side to that, um, I think when, when you, everyone would like to get more bang for their buck. So if they're going to do. A 30 minute session if by changing what they eat before or after that session is going to augment that response in a major way then why not um mm -hmm. so like you say if it might even explain the variance that we see um in people's health so you might get 100 people and they all say they exercise and we see differences in their metabolic health well it might be because some of them have been doing it faster than some haven't and just by chance um, and so we get that response. And so I do think there's value in understanding it. Um, mm -hmm. There's always value in improving the efficiency of exercise to improve health. Um, For the record, but... I'm on your side with this. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's not one or the other, is it? If, if we can get people more physically active for the sake of it and also increase the efficiency and effectiveness of exercise, then the same for both. Right. And how much do you think this has to come? It comes down to just insulin and carbohydrates versus calories, because now we're seeing more research coming out showing that protein ingestion preserves this fasted, like as far as substrate utilization goes, it looks the same as whether you're in the fasted state with this protein ingestion, or I'm sure fat would do the same. Um, so is it all just have to do with restricting carbohydrates before exercise or is there something inherent about being in the fasted state um in terms of the increase in fat oxidation during exercise that would be mainly driven by carbohydrate insulin um but i'm sure you could offset that benefit if you really overdid it on fat or protein and then therefore obliterated the negative energy balance so right. um again pro probably both Okay. Very wrong. And with all of this knowledge, what do you personally implement? Like what has changed your decisions around nutrition and exercise? Um, I try to do a bit of everything. So I do enjoy cycling and running when I can. I'm normally injured um, and <laughs> resistance training as well. Um, and yeah, I, I, so if I'm cycling into work then i'll normally wait and have breakfast at work on most of those days so try to do some of it in a fasted state i don't know if that is almost out of convenience more than anything else but at least uh there's some evidence to back it up as well yeah okay and what concerns would you have around fasted training and i don't know if there's much or any literature on resistance training um fasted versus fed in terms of like metabolic health stuff. I think Stu Phillips has done some stuff on protein 
synthesis and amino acid stuff. But yeah, what, what, what do you think about training in the fasted state? If you're going to lift weights, say you feel good. Like yeah. I feel good lifting without any food in my stomach. So is there anything I should be concerned about <laughs> or people in general? I I think with resistance exercise, not not much concern whether you're fasted or fed probably doesn't make much difference. Um, it's relatively glycolytic. And as long as you're having sufficient protein, then at some point in the day to to support protein synthesis and stimulate protein synthesis, then yeah, no, no issues with that. I would say there are some considerations with exercise in a fasted state that need more research and things like... Um, we know that markers of bone breakdown can be higher when we're in a fasted state than a fed state. Okay. Um, with what type of seems, exercise? Does it matter? That was, it's been shown with endurance based exercise. Um, the theory, or well, one of the theories is that when we exercise and we sweat, we sweat out calcium and the hormonal response to that leads to an increase in bone loss. Okay. Um, well, it, my body doesn't know how to regulate its temperature, so I don't <laughs> sleep that much when I work out. That's fine then, yeah. <laughs> and th th there seem to be ways we can offset that as well. So taking a calcium supplement before the exercise seems to um, abolish that okay, hormonal that's very metabolic cool. response. So, yeah. so if like um, an older individual, what, like a woman, post-menopause or something? or Exactly. It probably is worth taking... Um, calcium before or, or a protein rich meal before as well might might be beneficial where you still got the high fat oxidation rate um the protein itself can stimulate a hormonal response that seems to be beneficial for retaining bone as well um it's it's somewhat hypothetical because it hasn't been definitively shown but certainly the these markers of bone breakdown do seem to show this response um, okay. we're just extrapolating that that would have an effect on bone long term right right um, okay. Last segment, uh, sugars and different types of sugars and, um, your views, I guess, on all of this and the research you've, and I think you, you recently did that study with the manipulating sugar type versus total carbohydrates. Um, do you want to go into that study? Yeah, yeah, sure. So this is part of this. There's actually two phases to this study. So we've published the acute phase and we've got okay. um, a chronic phase that, um, we're still writing up at the moment. Um, and yeah, the idea behind this project was actually getting back to that idea of does carbohydrate availability affects physical activity and energy balance behaviors. Um, but we also took the opportunity to look at the metabolic responses as well. So we, and this was led by Aaron Hengist, who was a PhD student with me and is now a postdoc with Kevin Hall at the NIH. Wow, um, cool. And we, so we asked people to consume either a moderate sugar diet, so 50% of energy from carbohydrate, 20% of energy from free sugars, um, a sugar-restricted diet, which is in line with World Health Organization guidelines and UK guidelines, which is essentially no more than 5% of energy intake from free sugars. Okay. Wait, Still sorry. The first group, when you said 50% carbohydrate, and then you said 25%, 25% of that 50% is from free sugars? 20% of total energy intake from free sugar. So pretty high. So all together, 70% carbohydrate. No, sorry. Sorry. So 50% <laughs> total carbohydrate. Yeah. And 20%. So of that what, of being free yeah, sugars. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And then, so the, the middle group, the low sugar group, same amount of total carbohydrate. So 50% energy carbohydrate, but no more than 5% free sugars. Okay. And then the third group, uh, low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. And in this initial study, we studied them for 24 hours under relatively tightly controlled conditions. And then the second phase that um, we're still just writing up is over 12 weeks, we asked them to follow these diets. Um, and at least based on the acute study so far, um, in the metabolic responses, we saw not very much changing when they restricted sugar intake. The only real difference was change in blood lactate concentrations after eating. Hmm. Um, whereas we saw much larger changes when we changed the total carbohydrate content. Do you think that that acute lactate effect could be detrimental chronically? Or, I mean, maybe it's a good thing our brain likes lactate. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't view it as yeah, really positive or negative. It pro <laughs> what what we're fairly sure it represents is the fructose component of the sugars being converted into lactate by the liver. So okay. when the liver so fructose can't really be easily metabolized by things like muscle. Mm -hmm. um and so the liver is the organ that majorly metabolizes fructose and it's got a few options as to what it can do with fructose it can convert it into glycogen it can convert it into glucose lactate or fat triglyceride um known as de novo lipogenesis um and if we overeat sugars then it, we do stimulate de novo lipogenesis and that might contribute to things like high blood lipids or high liver fat concentrations for example um, in this scenario, I think at least some of that fructose would be being converted into glucose and lactate. And that's why we saw those increase in, in lactate concentrations. Interesting. Cause energy was matched, like calories weren't yeah. matched. Energy matched. Yeah. Yeah. And so the result was that no change in energy expenditure or physical activity. Not acutely. within this first 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. And a cool finding from this was that women got into ketosis much more rapidly than men. Um, exactly. And that makes me think, I wonder if overnight fasting for a woman, they would have higher ketones in the morning, um, doing yeah. a fasted bout of exercise. Like maybe women, if they're doing fasted exercise, they have higher ketone levels than, than, uh, men or like what happens post-exercise too. But exactly. Yeah. And we, we, we've got a study ongoing at the moment actually where we're looking to recruit people to do exercise training fasted or fed but we're specifically looking at male female differences so yeah keen keen to explore that ourselves awesome that will be awesome is it are you just basically copying the um rob enberg's training um, study? He, uh it's very closely based on that but um it's slightly longer slightly more um practically relevant so the other one was in the lab um, quite controlled training this one's a bit more free living as well um, no, so it's led by you're not gonna get all the douglas bags from <laughs> all these men and women yeah not not this time unfortunately yeah <laughs> that is such a cool study that's cool to see the fat oxidation over the entire every single bout of exercise that's awesome um that's so fructose though people think of fructose as being really bad um it's um, core, like associated with high fructose corn syrup, or, uh, but it's the major sugar in fruit. Well, I think, am I saying that right? It is the major sugar yeah. in fruit. Yeah. Okay. Um, which fruit obviously is not associated with poor health. Uh, so what context or nuance do you wish people understood about fructose? Um, and what does, how important is energy balance if we're going to consider any effects of fructose? Yeah. Um, energy balance is important and I guess I'll tackle the, the fruit versus actual table sugars first of all so okay. both in dose and rate of digestion there are large differences so the fructose we get from eating whole fruit um, we're not going to get the same total amount from eating fruit you have to eat a lot of fruit to get a large amount of fructose and also even if you did eat that amount because of the structure of the the fruit when it's slowly digested and absorbed, it's going to have very different effects on the body than if you say drink a soda. Right. Um, what about fruit juice though? Would it fruit juice well, be I was like just soda? About to say, oh. <laughs> yeah, it would be handled more like soda. So, okay. and, it, and in, in most of the guidelines, if you're considering that dietary guideline to restrict free sugars, um, fruit juice is considered a free sugar. So basically as soon as you've um, processed the fruit, it's now becoming a free sugar. Once you've disrupted the food matrix and the structure of the fruit, um, it's now free sugar, more rapidly digested and absorbed. Um, even then, I think a lot of the concerns of fructose sometimes overplayed, at least the wide range of health effects. So for example, we know from tightly controlled feeding studies in humans, that it doesn't have an independent effect on body weight. So if, for example, you overfeed people fructose versus other types of carbohydrates there's no differential gain in fat mass um what fructose might do um under overfeeding conditions is affect liver fat and affects liver glucose production or liver insulin sensitivity doesn't seem to have a large effect on muscle insulin sensitivity 
So there are some potential downsides of very high fructose intakes, especially with overfeeding. Um, in energy balance, those effects are much less clear. And I guess even more important, coming back to the physical activity point, there are some really neat studies where people were overfed fructose with and without exercise. And if they were exercising, they were overfed even more fructose to offset the energy expended through exercise. And again, it seems like very little effects of fructose if people are physically active. So probably comes back to that energy turnover issue. And I equally don't want to downplay the issue. So for people who uh, have a relatively sedentary lifestyle for whatever reason or just can't do as much physical activity, maybe there are some metabolic health benefits of, of keeping fructose intake somewhat low, especially free sugars. Um, and the kind of government guidance, the main rationale for restricting sugars in general is, um, is that a diet high in free sugars tends to lead to a high total energy intake. And so it can be a good way to make, sure, and, and we've seen that in some of our studies where if people try to restrict their free sugar intake, they tend to naturally then lose a bit of weight over time, probably because they're just eating less total calories. Right. And this is just kind of almost taking the responsibility out of the public by just saying reduce total free sugar intake, it does get really confusing because then scientists are like, no, there's nothing inherently bad about carbohydrates or sugar or something. But then everyone, the general understanding is, oh no, sugars are bad. Carbohydrates are, if you want to lose weight, you just restrict carbohydrates and things like that. It's, there's so much to balance between understanding nuance and context and then like once you understand the context it's like I can understand why the general public is so confused um I mean I'm confused and I'm reading literature all day every day so it's definitely um hard to communicate context to people um and physiology is so confusing itself so uh, yeah, it's a lot to wrap my head around, but I appreciate your perspectives on everything and the way that you present it. Um, I need to get you more active on Twitter though. So the rest of the, everyone else can dive into all of everything in your brain. But if you, I guess, like, what do you think, or like, what do you wish people understood more if you were to simplify carbohydrates exercise well one that fructose overfeeding with exercise preventing the effects of fructose that's super cool and just shows the power of exercise like physical activity is amazing and it's clear that it protects us against most other like i guess i don't know the word i'm looking for insults that we place on ourselves in our daily life like exercise seems to protect us against a lot of insults even like sleep deprivation and anything that's Ill promoting ill health being sedentary seems to make it worse um but if you were to like leave anyone with practical takeaways advice like what how do you view like a very realistic lifestyle um i guess um it probably comes down to the lifestyle that people are going to stick to. And that applies to both physical activity and diet. So um, whilst there are, even within energy balance, you can get small differences in health based on a specific type of exercise or a specific dietary composition. It makes a bigger difference to, if, if we need some, to lose some weight, it makes a bigger difference to lose the weight in almost whatever way than to make smaller changes without losing the weight so um if we can be physically active and maintain a healthy body weight we're getting the majority of the way there and so at least at the population level that would be the most efficient way to keep the population healthy with individuals then looking to get the absolute most out of their exercise and their diet then of course paying more attention i think education is key it's why um yeah it's important to do these kind of things and um, understand the science better um, we need to do more research into these diets and exercise strategies so that we can all learn about them um and i think in terms of a a key understanding it probably is useful for people to remember that um 
exercise can be both powerful in terms of its effects on metabolism and our ability to maintain health and also maybe not so powerful. So it might not be the panacea for weight loss if that's the only thing we're interested in. But even if you don't see weight loss, there's probably a whole load of other things going on that exercise is, is improving as well. Right. Cool. And where can people find you? So I'm on Twitter, I go through patches of being more or less active. Uh, and my handle is at uh, Gonzalez underscore JT. Um, and then on there, there's a link to my university website as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation and I think I could talk to you for five more hours, but I will let you get on with your day. Um, and yeah, I just want to thank you again. Great. Thanks, Christy.